Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at Glendale Heights United Methodist Church in Durham, North Carolina. My name is John Shugart. I serve as the pastor here and I'm joined this morning by Amy Davis, our organist and choir director, and also on video by a few of our congregation members who have volunteered to uh, light our Advent candle and, and do some other uh, special things for Advent this morning. As you come into this time of worship, I encourage you to use the comment sections to greet one another. And if you're watching later on YouTube, I would greet you as well whenever you uh, watch this service. So now as we move into this time of worship together, let's focus our hearts and minds through this prelude of music. Good morning and welcome again to this time of worship with Glendale Heights United Methodist Church. My name is John Shugart. I serve as the pastor here. We want to welcome you to this time, whether you're watching right now live or watching later on YouTube. We pray that these next 30 minutes or so will be a blessing for you and whoever you're watching with. Just a few announcements this morning. Um, we want to invite you to our Thursday book study of the Adam Hamilton book we're using during this time of Advent called Incarnation, and that'll happen Thursday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. So if you're interested, let us know and we'll send you the Zoom link this week. We also have our stewardship campaign that is ongoing. Tom Warner sent an email out about this, and we have envelopes up here at the church for you to fill out your stewardship uh, commitment for this year. And I just want to say thank you for all of you who will fill that out. Uh, this has been a strange year to say the least, but I have been so encouraged by the continued faithful giving of our congregation and by you filling out this stewardship card for next year, we'll be able to uh, develop a budget that we can use to continue our ministry here at Glendale Heights uh, for next year. So we would encourage you to grab one of those cards and fill it out and drop it back off at the church. We also uh, want to take a minute to, to just mention that we as a church have been monitoring the rise in COVID cases in North Carolina. I think over the weekend we set some records for daily case numbers and our positivity rate I think is around 11% right now. Um, and so for everything we do for the rest of this Advent and Christmas season through the end of the year, we will be um, letting you know uh, what that impacts here at the church right now. Um, we're still uh, figuring out our plan for Christmas Eve, but as soon as we know that, we will update you as well. With that, today is a communion Sunday, and because of cooler weather and also just not wanting folks to be outside for as long as we've done, we're going to have communion today outside at the church, uh, so we would invite you to come at around 1145 after this service ends, but it's going to be the drive-up style that we did the first few times. So. I would invite you, bring your mask and, and stay physically distant from one another. 
you can still uh, hang out in the, on the patio area, but we're going to just do the communion liturgy during this service time online, and then you'll come and, and receive the elements outside. So you can fellowship after that, uh, as we've been doing, but we just wanted to limit the amount of time we're spending outside this morning because it is cooler today. So I will hopefully see everyone uh, who feels comfortable coming up here at the church following this service. Uh, so now, as we move uh, into the second week of Advent, I would invite you to watch this video of lighting of the second Advent candle. Welcome to Glendale Heights United Methodist Church. I am your lay member of the annual conference, Tom Walters. I will be doing the Advent wreath for uh, the second week. And I will begin with the lighting. Don't be afraid. Look, I bring you good news. Wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. Whether we look out to the world around us, or into our own hearts, we recognize our deep need for salvation. We light the second Advent candle to signify our longing for a rescuer, a helper, one who will deliver us from our sins, from despair, even from death. Jesus, you are Savior. Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, you can only admit our own unrighteousness, our world's deep brokenness. In gratitude, we praise you for giving your Son to be our Savior. In humility, we pray you will guide us now by your Spirit to live more fully and freely as your forgiven people. Amen. We want to thank Tommy this week for being our Advent candle lighter um, as, he, as we remember this week uh, that Jesus is our Savior and as we light the, the love candle this morning. So now let's join our voices and sing our first hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful, and the words to that will be on the screen. I would invite you now to spend some time 
uh, in prayer as we have a musical reflection, but also to share your prayer requests, your celebrations, and your concerns in the comment section so that we can share those on the screen with you as we spend time together in prayer. So now if you'll join me um, in prayer as we remember uh, the prayer requests, the celebrations and concerns of our congregation and our friends. Uh, So this morning, uh, so far in the comments, I don't see any shared, but we do want to remember this week, Pam Norris and her family, uh, her nephew Pat passed away um, this past week, uh, which was something that was expected, but also um, something that's very sad for her and her family. So Pam, we we lift you up in prayer this morning, and uh, we lift up your family as well. We also just want to be in prayer as the students and teachers for Durham Public Schools finish up their semester. Uh, Certainly we want to remember our students, Amy, Ramey, and and Emily, as they finish strong this semester, this virtual uh, semester. And, um, and so we pray for the teachers and students of Durham Public Schools. Um, also, uh, so Tom Simmons wants us to pray for the mission at Urban Ministries for Christmas Eve, um, something that we'll be a part of in a different way this year, but also uh, something that we want to remember just for all of the organizations that are... Um, helping our uh, brothers and sisters who are living in homelessness and uh, experiencing poverty this Christmas. Um, And then Ken would like us to to celebrate Emily's friend's mother, Amanda, who had successful brain surgery on Tuesday. So we certainly lift up uh, Emily's friend's mother, Amanda, and uh, we give thanks for a successful uh, surgery this, um, this past week. So let's pray together. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, uh, for the opportunity to worship you through technology and for the opportunity to receive communion this morning and to fellowship outside. Uh, God, we pray for um, safety and for protection. We pray, God, that um, as each of us worship this morning, uh, we would feel um, surrounded by your love and then surrounded by our community here, and that we would go out and serve and love our community around us. And God, this morning, uh, we especially lift up Pam and her family. We lift up the students and teachers of Durham Public Schools. Uh, We lift up the ministries of, uh, or the mission of Urban Ministries and other organizations in town who are helping our neighbors uh, with meet their physical needs. mental and spiritual needs this Christmas season. 
Um, and God, we, uh, we continue to pray for our world and our country and our state as we deal with COVID. We ask uh, God that, um, that we would have the strength to pray, 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 Okay, it looks like I froze. I think I'm back. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see and hear this Chrismon moment uh, with Janae this, this week. Welcome to the Chrismon moment at Glendale Heights United Methodist Church. Before you today, you see two Chrismons. First is the Lamb of Salvation. The lamb alludes to the perfect sacrifice, the story of Abraham needing a sacrifice for God and God providing a lamb instead of Isaac. Second, you see the cross on the lamb, which alludes to Christ himself being the perfect sacrifice for our sins, our Savior. Second, you see the shepherd's crook, cross. The cross, of course, alluding to Christ. But you also see the shepherd's crook. In Psalm 23, we learn that the shepherd is more than just the sheep's salvation. The shepherd shows the sheep where to eat, where to lay down, where the best places are to be in life. We should be reminded by the shepherd's crook cross that Jesus is not only our salvation through the cross, but also our salvation for each and every day, for every situation in life. He shows us how we should live our lives. Let us remember to think of the shepherd's crook cross and the Lamb of Salvation as working together in our lives, both to secure salvation from our sins, not just our sins, but also our everyday lives. Thank you, Janae, for our Chrismon moment. Uh, this week, our <clears throat> scripture comes from we have one from Matthew and one from Luke, so we're, we're covering all the bases as far as the, the Christmas story goes. Uh, so our, our first scripture is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. It says, But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 12, In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. 
And this is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable unto you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So this week as we, uh, as we celebrate the second week of Advent and we've uh, lit the love candle this morning, we are reminded of the greatest act of love, which is Jesus coming to be with us in the flesh and living with us and dying for us and being resurrected as our Savior. And so like last week, we talked about Jesus' royal titles, Christ, Messiah, and King. This week, we focus on what it means to call Jesus our Savior. And this uh, is in the recurring uh, sermon series of what it means, uh, what the significance of Christmas is through the lens of the incarnation, through looking at what it means for Jesus to be uh, God with us, God in the flesh. And so this morning, as we think about Jesus as our Savior, we have to ask the question, well, what is Jesus saving us from? And so the, the Christian answer to that question is, is from sin. And I know uh, that Advent or the Christmas season is, is not the typical time where we want to delve into our sinful nature and, and how bad we are and, and, and our sinfulness as, as humans. But in order to talk about Jesus' work as Savior, we have to understand what Jesus saves us from. And so sin uh, is something that we talk about in the church a lot. It's, it's one of those words that um, we know what it means, but we use it in different ways. So one way that we think about sin is, is anything uh, that we do, say, feel, or that becomes a part of us that, that separates us from God, that uh, moves us further away from God. In the Hebrew, the word used for sin often is a word that means to miss the mark um, or stray from the path. And that means uh, that in our Christian faith as the people of God, we, we believe that there is um, a mark to hit or a, a path to follow in order to, be, um, in order to uh, satisfy being in relationship with God. And so we, we think of sin and we can, we can think of it in, in a couple different ways. We, we can think of internal sin and also external sin. Internal sin would be those seven deadliest sins of the Christian tradition, uh, which are pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. And... Uh, all of these things are, are part of being human, right? At, at some point, all of us have felt jealousy or envy. Um, maybe we see our neighbor get a new car or, or that their house is bigger and we feel a sense of, of jealousy or envy. Um, you know, maybe, maybe at Christmas or Thanksgiving, we, <clears throat> we eat too much. Uh, and so that's, that's gluttonous. It's, it's not such a bad thing when, when these things are just a, a surface level sort of going about, but when they, when they penetrate deeper into our nature is when we, when we find ourselves living in sin, right? So, so maybe, uh, maybe that jealousy towards your neighbor's car uh, isn't, isn't so bad just in that instance, but when, when we become envious and jealous people who aren't content with the things we have that don't give thanks for the blessings in our lives, uh, we have sinned. Or maybe, you know, one day a year we, we eat too much, but when, uh, when living in a state of, of eating or, or drinking too much or consuming too much or or going after things just to, to give ourselves pleasure, then we're, we're living in sin. And, and, and greed is something that causes us to, to want more and more and more. And so if we, if we act on that and we, we stockpile things and we hoard things, then, then our, our nature, our being, begins to be corrupted. And maybe... Uh, maybe worst of all is pride. 
thinking that we are the the center of the universe, that we are infallible, that we uh, are entitled to whatever we want, uh, that we are proud and and, uh, arrogant people. And so these are internal sins, things that that corrupt our way of living, and and internally these are are part of our, our human nature as sinners, Uh, But then external sin might be acting on those things in a way that hurts ourselves or hurts others, our relationships with people, or collectively hurts the community and the society that we live as a part of. So, for instance, the external manifestation of sin in the form of greed could be that one group stockpiles everything and takes and takes and takes and one group is left out. Or if we, uh, if we have lust in our hearts and we, um, we act on that lust, we may, uh, we may find ourselves in, in an extramarital affair and, and damage not only our own family and ourselves and our relationships, but also another family. And if we collectively are prideful, then we live in a world where we don't see our neighbors, where we don't love our neighbors, where we don't hear the cry of those who are needy, who who need our help. We don't put God at the center of our lives. Something else will go there. And so this is sin. This is this is what in Matthew it says that Jesus will come to save the sins of his people. And so in Luke it says that that the Savior has been born. This is what the incarnation means, that Jesus coming in flesh means that that our Savior is here to save our sins. So what does it mean uh, to be saved? What does it mean to have a Savior? And so there's there's a lot of different ways to to think about that as well. Uh, A Savior restores and repairs and redeems things. Restores things to be whole and repairs brokenness and redeems corrupted and sinful nature and people. A Savior also uh, can be associated with the words uh, deliverance and help, healing and rescuing. And so what are we saved from? One of the biggest thing that sin in our own lives or in our relationships can lead to is is to shame and guilt. We feel bad about the things that we do or who we have become. And this can lead us into living lives that are full of despair and, and hopelessness. But Jesus, time and time again throughout Scripture, came to those who were in despair and hopeless, to those who were called by society as as sinners, and he gave them purpose. So we're saved from hopelessness to purpose. When Jesus comes into our lives and, and restores and repairs and redeems the broken and corrupt nature inside of us, he doesn't leave us there. He calls us into lives of purpose, lives of sacrifice and giving and serving. Another consequence of sin is that we feel alone. Whether we have damaged relationships in our lives or whether because of the way that we feel about ourselves, we've chosen to isolate ourselves away. Living in sin can feel very alone. But we see a God who comes in Jesus to remind us that through the incarnation that God is with us always, no matter how alone we feel, there is a Savior who has come to walk alongside us, to be there as our, as our helper and our rescuer from this feeling of isolation. So we are saved from feeling alone into being loved. In this act of incarnation, in this event of Jesus coming to be with us, we are reminded that we aren't alone. And and the way that this happens is through Jesus' showing of love to each of us. Romans 8 says that nothing can separate us from this love of God through Jesus Christ. And so in this act of, of saving, we don't have to feel alone anymore. 
We can feel loved. Even, even if there's no one else around us, we know that we have a Savior in Jesus Christ who loves us. And going back to Genesis and the creation stories, our, our sin and our fall from, uh, from Eden and from the, the, the way that God intended the world to be where people didn't die and, and there wasn't aloneness and there wasn't hopelessness, a consequence of our sin is death. But in Scripture it says that Jesus came even to rescue us and deliver us from slavery to sin and even death. And though we may die uh, in, in our mortal lives, through Jesus we are saved from death and given life. Through this act of love and the incarnation and Jesus' death on a cross and resurrection, we are promised life eternal. We are promised that we will no longer die. That we have a place in God's kingdom forever. And so this incarnation... This event of of God coming to be in the world, embodied, walking with us, is the ultimate act of God's love towards us, towards sinful and broken and corrupt people. And because of this and God's redeeming of our corrupt nature, of our saving, of our delivering, of our rescuing, we are then called into this life of following Jesus Christ. We are called to sacrifice, to be selfless individuals who serve others. We are called to bring hope and love and embody that same love that we are shown in the lives of those we interact with. We are called also to, as a society, as, a, as the people of God, to, to embody justice, to restore society to a wholeness. We are called to embody mercy by forgiving those in our lives, by forgiving those who have harmed us, by forgiving those who have sinned against us. We're called to humility and kindness to show others what it's like to feel loved, to remove ourselves from the center, to remove pride from the equation, to put God at the center, to love God fully with everything that we are, and then to leave and go from this place to love others as we have been loved. So this week, as we remember God's love through us by sending his son Jesus, to be our Savior, we light the Christ candle, or the, the love candle, rather, as a sign of, of God's love being a light in a dark world. And in just a moment, we will share together in the communion liturgy, which is a reminder, again, of God's love, an ultimate act of love toward us. John fifteen thirteen says, Greater love has no one than this to lay one's life down for one's friend. Jesus coming to walk with us, to show us we're not alone, to die for us on a cross for our sin, and then to be resurrected, to redeem us, to give us life, to save us. We're called to do this act of communion and remembrance of that love. And I pray this morning that as you receive these communion elements of Jesus' body and blood, that you remember that you aren't alone, that you are loved and that you have been saved by the Savior this Advent season. Amen. Let's now sing our second hymn, Away in a Manger. The words will be on the screen.
Hear now this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now in uh, several moments of silence, I would invite you to confess those things both internally and externally that have been sins in your life to God. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, Lord, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin, and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit when the lord jesus ascended he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and holy spirit and on the night in which he gave himself up for us he took bread and gave thanks to you he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of God's children, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, and because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the blood of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ, which has been given for you. Amen. So now, uh, if you're watching online and you can't make it up to the church, I would invite you to, to spend some time in prayer. I would invite you, um, if you, if you feel so led, to participate in a love feast uh, with bread and juice and to join us in this participation in Christ's body and blood. If you do join us here at the church, uh, we will have the, um, the individual communion cups here, and so you can drive up and with your mask on, come and receive communion. Um, but however you participate this morning, I pray that you know that you are forgiven and that you are loved. So come and be a part of this great love. Amen.